President of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, President of the Candy Society for Medicine, and colleagues. I have been requested to speak on the role of the SLMC in maintaining professional standards. Now, the SLMC does play a very important role uh, in maintaining professional standards. I think it's important to realize that the SLMC is an integral part of the machinery of justice in the state. By an act of parliament, it is conferred powers to regulate the profession. So, the SLMC is not a mere administrative device, as uh, some people imagine. So, how does the SLMC maintain professional standards? Its main aim is to protect the health of the public and their reasonable expectations of a medical service. To regulate and supervise those engaged in the practices of medicine. Prescribe the minimum qualifications for registration. Register qualified persons and maintain registers. Deregister practitioners found guilty of criminal acts. So that's number five on my slide. As you see, to regulate and supervise. So then if you regulate and supervise, you also have the power to deregister practitioners found guilty of criminal acts. So to do this, you can entertain complaints against those registered. And the SLMC has laid down procedures for inquiry into complaints. Once it inquires, it can warn or place sanctions on those who violate codes of ethical or professional practice. Then, the SLMA also maintains professional standards by accrediting and monitoring standards of medical and paramedical training. To do all this, SLMC has set up committees and the infrastructure necessary for the fulfillment of its functions. SLMC has also the power to pass regulations. SLMC has laid down codes of, codes of ethical and professional behavior. Now, that's just a picture of the medical ordinance uh, revised up to 1988. Now, the composition of the SLMC, I'll run through this fairly fast. 25 members, deans or nominees of all medical and dental faculties, elected members, nominees of the minister, representatives of the dental practitioners, representatives of persons entitled to practice medicine who are registered under Section 41, for example, the RMPs. Now, the committees I spoke of, there is the management committee, the finance committee, the education committee, the foreign degrees committee, internship committee, the preliminary proceedings committee, which we call the PPC. Now, this is the committee, very important one, which when a complaint is made, makes the initial inquiries and writes a very comprehensive report uh, having summoned witnesses. Now they present their report to the Professional Conduct Committee, the PCC. I speak about those two committees uh, more uh, in a little while. So to summarize what I have been saying so far, the functions of the SLMC registration and of course, I should add that they are deregistration when necessary. Scrutiny to ensure maintenance of minimum standards of medical education.
protection. C. Investigating complaints against those registered by the Medical Council and other functions. For instance, the Medical Ordinance empowers the Medical Council to make representation to the government on any matter connected with the medical profession in Sri Lanka. So that's uh, a wide sweep of things, the issues that the SLMC can take up if they so want. Now, let me first deal with maintenance of standards of medical education. Now, the SLMC fulfills this function by publishing guidelines of standards pertaining to entry criteria, duration of course, curriculum, staff, facilities, and clinical training that are expected of local and foreign medical schools through inspection and scrutiny of local medical schools, through scrutiny and approval of foreign medical schools which undertake to the training of Sri Lankan citizens, by conducting licensing examination for graduates of foreign medical schools, the so-called ERPM or the X16, which has come into uh, much discussion recently. Then they also scrutinize postgraduate medical education and the SLMC maintains the standards of medical education by fostering continuous professional development. Now, the SLMC is empowered by the medical ordinance to give two weeks notice and visit any medical school in Sri Lanka or any medical school overseas which provides medical education to Sri Lankan citizens. Now, we have always had our guidelines for medical schools which we amend from time to time. Recently, they were revised and we have published them. Now, the most recent publication is entitled Guidelines and Specifications on Standards and Criteria for Accreditation of Medical Schools in Sri Lanka and Courses of Study provided by them. So, this time when we laid our guidelines, we also thought that we would have an accreditation process so that the medical schools in Sri Lanka, whether they be public or private, will know what their accreditation standard is. Now, these were developed by a wide, um, we had a conference first and then there was a consultative process and these uh, guidelines uh, are according to uh, agree with the subject benchmark statement by the Vice Chancellors and Directors of the UGC in 2004 and a WHO publication on guidelines for accreditation of medical schools in countries of the Southeast Asia region. That was published in 2009. Now, I told you about accreditation, that not only do we lay guidelines, we also have a uh, process of accreditation. So, the SLMC has developed a scoring system when we send our teams on site infections. This is the tool, the scoring system, which will be used when rating medical schools for accreditation. For instance, the scoring system, I'll deal with this very briefly, is in two parts. Part A identifies absolute criteria considered during the accreditation process. Medical schools being inspected for accreditation with the Sri Lanka Medical Council are required to fulfill these absolute criteria. Any institution that does not meet Every single one of these absolute criteria will be rejected. Any further evaluation of that medical school 
would be for formative purposes only. I think this accreditation system is very relevant in light of the private medical schools that are said to be coming in. Now part B of the scoring system identifies eight accreditation categories. These have to be considered for accreditation and each accreditation category has a number of important subcomponents. So inspectors are requested to give a single global rating between 0 to 5 for each subcomponent and then each uh, the marks that the accreditation category gets is totaled up. Now let me just show you the absolute criteria. I, do, I won't read through all these. For instance, one is selection process and minimum entry criteria. Uh, do they conform to the UGC or national guidelines? Let me go to six. Dedicated hospital for clinical activities with a minimum of 100 beds each in general medicine, general surgery, pediatrics and obstetrics and gynecology. Let me go to, I think the numbering has gone wrong, but the next one, which is in highlighted in yellow, affiliation with the JMO for teaching medical legal content. Next one, identified community for field-based training. And the last one, with the public health service provide, providers of the area. Example, the MOH, the municipal council, the urban council. These are absolute criteria that have to be there if the medical school is to be recognized. Lastly, I have just highlighted the more important ones. All heads of departments and at least 70% of other academic staff should be permanent full-time staff. Now, other accreditation criteria I won't go into because I run out of time. Let's look at the foreign medical schools. Now, based on a court decision at the licensing exam called the ERPM, foreign medical graduates at the, sit the common MCQ papers given to students in government medical faculties. And the comparative performance is very poor. Their performance at the clinical component of the ERPM also has demonstrated insufficient skills, especially in obstetrics and gynecology and pediatrics. I am talking in general terms. This does not apply to every single foreign medical school. There are some of the graduates which come from some of those schools are quite competent in clinical skills as well as in their uh, theory. Now, according to the present provisions of the medical ordinance, as at present, the derecognition process of foreign medical schools is laborious. Some foreign medical schools recruit Sri Lankans with only, we did a study on this. We did a study on the uh, qualifications with which they entered. <coughs> Some of these foreign medical schools. And we found that some of them have gone there only with O levels. Then they are given a one year, some uh, introductory course or you know something. Some of them had gone with one A level, some had gone with two A levels, and some had gone with commerce subjects. So this we found was quite shocking. I'm not talking of the majority. In this study we did, about 70% were okay. But among the rest of that 30%, you got these people. So this is something that we have to be aware of. So now we have laid down very stringent criteria for recognizing foreign medical schools. Pertaining to course of study, minimum duration of number of academic years, twinning programs. They can have twinning programs between medical schools which 
are already recognized by us abroad. But we don't approve training programs where part of the medical curriculum is in Sri Lanka and if they go and do the clinical uh, training in <coughs> abroad. Then student selection. Medical students admitted. Now we have laid down a rule after 2010 June. Anyone admitted to a foreign medical school should have had 13 years of formal education and at least two credit passes in biology, chemistry uh, and physics. So then staffing policy. We have policies that those medical schools have to have about the student staff ratio. Should be at least 7.1, not greater than 14.1. Clinical training facilities. We have laid down criteria that a medical school should have its own teaching hospital or have an agreement to affiliate with the other teaching hospitals. And uh, the last one on the slide, the methods of student assessment should match the objectives of the medical school. So before we recognize a medical school, they, they have to fill a very uh, searching and comprehensive form and based on what they say we will either approve them or not give them approval but if there is a doubt because many of these people can't even fill the form then we will send uh, two people to go and inspect that medical school and now the period of recognition that we give this medical schools is five years. At the end of that five years we will review them especially we will examine how well the students qualifying from that medical school have done at the ERPM or X16 examination. So in the last uh, two or three years uh, criteria for recognizing foreign medical schools has been very, very stringent, has become very stringent. Now, now let, let me get on to investigating of complaints against those registered by the medical council. Now, <coughs> these complaints are uh, looked at by uh, three committees. The management committee looks at very minor complaints and this is really uh, for corrective reasons. For instance, there was a complaint that a general practitioner is using three interns in his practice. So we just called him, we called the pre-interns and we had a chat with them and said this is, you can get into serious trouble if you are doing this, please don't do this. So the management committee deals with a few minor uh, offences such as that so that the major offences are left to the PPC. Then the PPC is the fact-finding committee which investigates only complaints submitted in the form of sworn affidavits. They, if there is no affidavit, we tell the people, okay, if you want, submit this complaint in the form of an affidavit. Otherwise, we are not going to examine it. Now, the PPC takes a fairly long time there are about, uh, let me say, about six or seven members. Uh, because they look at the bedhead tickets, they take a statement from the complainant, they take a statement from the doctor concerned, witnesses, they get the bedhead notes. So one of these inquiries can take a fairly long time, but the final report they submit is very comprehensive. And this is examined by the next committee, the PCC. 
the professional conduct committee. Now they examine the facts collected by the PPC and they take a decision. Their job is to take a decision, weigh everything. They don't call these doctors uh, to the PCC again. They have to decide whether charges should be framed or not. Now, if charges are framed against the uh, person who uh, is under inquiry, then that person has to face a formal inquiry. It's rather like a court of law that we engage a prosecuting lawyer and the person can retain, bring his own lawyer and defend himself. And then uh, at the formal inquiry a decision will be made whether uh, serious uh, action is going to be taken against him. Now, when the PPC and the PCC examine a case uh, or a, of a, say a doctor against whom a complaint has been made, they have as their guideline the SLMA guideline on ethics and professional behavior. We have two books. We have published two books. One is on ethics and professional conduct. And the other one is on serious professional misconduct. So these are the two books that we use. And recently, I can remember uh, before I left the SLMC, on negligence, in order to judge negligence, we are being guided by uh, Professor Corwin Gurunathan's book, which he published on the Priyani Soisa case. So that's a very good book, and that has the clear guidelines on how you judge whether there has been negligence or not. Now, copies of this SLMA guidelines are given to every doctor when they register with the SLMC. And they are available to any doctor who wants to collect copies of them. So when these complaints come, all complaints are judged against these guidelines. We have laid down guidelines. Have these guidelines been violated? That is the question we ask. So if I might just tell you the main questions that are considered during the investigations. For instance, is he guilty of serious professional misconduct? Is he guilty of conduct that demonstrates such lack of knowledge or lack of skills, judgment or care as required by a medical practitioner in the practice of his profession? Now, there are several doctors who have been deregistered in the UK because they were found to be incompetent. And there are one or two who have been deregistered in Sri Lanka uh, because colleagues have complained that they are incompetent. And so this was inquired into. Then next has he been found to be medically unfit. This too can be, he may not be aware of fit himself, but other colleagues can bring it to the notice of the medical council. Is he guilty of any act which in the opinion of the medical council brings disrepute to the medical profession? There are several such uh, complaints which have come to us. Uh, one of the less, I suppose, less severe, I don't know whether I should say that, uh, has been alcoholism. And... Uh, behaving publicly in a way that brings disrepute to the profession. That is one example. At the other end of the scale, there are worse examples. There are uh, people who have tried to uh, sexually molest patients. So these are the 
uh, complaints which bring the medical bring uh, disrepute to the medical profession. Then uh, has he been convicted of a crime or criminal offence as defined by defined by the criminal procedure code or any other enactment with regard to crime? Now, if he is convicted of a criminal offence in Sri Lanka, then we don't go into lengthy uh, investigations. We take that court decision and only ask for his explanation before action is taken. Now, if, uh, so as I said, that slide just explains that, that he'll be asked for explanation if he has been convicted in a court of law, for example. For example, he has been convicted and found guilty of murder. No point in our investigating that. Uh, now, what are the punishments that these people can be given? Uh, these punishments were drafted two years back and we have handed them to the medical, to the health ministry because we have to go through them uh, to, towards amendments to the ordinance. He can be warned. He can be requested to give an undertaking that he will abstain from conduct regarding which the complaint was made. He can be placed under supervised practice or he can be placed under conditional practice. Now what I mean by the difference between supervised practice and conditional practice is if there is conditional practice, for instance, you might tell a surgeon if he is found incompetent of conducting surgery, you can practice as a doctor, but you cannot operate. You can't practice as a surgeon. Then uh, the doc another punishment, he can be fined or his registration can be suspended for a specified period or there can be permanent erasure of his name from the register. Now, we plan that such punishments will be notified in the Gazette and in the Medical Council website. As you know, in the UK, the GMC publishes all this on their website. And that name, if there has been an inquiry against a doctor or if he has been found guilty, they are flagged in red. Those names are permanently flagged in red in our register. Then certificates of good standing. We expect any doctor who has been registered with us, if he stays overseas for more than two years, when he returns to practice to bring a certificate of good standing from that medical council. <coughs> now, disciplinary action taken by medical councils overseas against doctors registered by the medical council in Sri Lanka, if they are found guilty of any offence, those medical councils inform us in writing. Name of the doctor, registered qualification, and they say, I am writing to advise you of the outcome of GFC fitness to practice hearing. So they let us know about. And what we have decided is any medical council finds a person guilty who is registered with us, we are not going to have a lengthy inquiry on that. Just as if a doctor is uh, found guilty in a court of law in Sri Lanka, we accept what that medical council is saying. We will only ask him to give his explanation and then uh, decide on the punishment. So, we will, that's a slide just explaining that we will follow, uh, we will completely accept the findings of the medical council overseas. So, I have now gone through with you registration and deregistration, I should have put it there. How we scrutinize medical education, 
and how we investigate complaints against those registered by the medical council. And I think taken all together, uh, in this way the SLMC plays a very important role in maintaining professional standards of doctors. Thank you.